All right, so we're here in the high desert. And if you don't know anything about the high desert, uh, there's a couple of things you should know. In the Inland Empire, elevation, I think, is around 3,000 feet. And so with that, um, you get a very interesting uh, climate up here. Because what you have, are it's a desert, so it's very dry, very arid, okay? Not a lot of, uh, not a lot of rain or anything of that sort. But you also get, um, because of the elevation, you get these very, very cold winters, very cold. And it was not uncommon for me in my youth to experience snow days. We would have them. I know it's, it seems strange to think about you're in Southern California, you're not in the mountains. I'm not, I mean, you can, I don't know if you can really see in the background shots, um, but you know, it's, it's flat, it's a desert. I mean, there's some hills. You can see the mountains behind us and around us. But it's not, um, certainly not a mountainous region. And so, sure, you're in Southern California, but it's not Big Bear. It's not Wrightwood or Crestline. But we would still have these snow days where we would get maybe a few, a couple few inches, maybe a foot of snow if we were lucky. But um, living in this, this area, it was just, it was really exciting as a kid. Um, because you did have this, this weather, these seasons, um, but just a lot of this open land. And so boredom as a child was accompanied with exploration, right? There wasn't, um, there wasn't time or there weren't activities to keep you immediately entertained all the time. And so you know, where it'd be easy, maybe if you were, you know, and you're in a more urban area, you could very easily maybe walk to a bowling alley as a kid or ride your bike maybe to the mall. Uh, we did have a mall and I did spend a lot of time there, but the mall, it's a 30 minute drive across town, just along Main Street. Or you, I guess you could, we did a few times, you would take the bus all the way across town, but it wasn't not easy to get to by any stretch and not really something when you're, you know, you're a teenager, you're going to go do by yourself. So because of the area and where I was, you really had to kind of entertain yourself. And growing up, we didn't have streaming. We didn't have video on demand in the same way we do now. And so sure, maybe you'd throw the TV on, but wouldn't be that. Maybe it's, you know, the 10th time you're going to watch Shawshank Redemption in, in the week. You didn't want to watch it or you just didn't want to watch The Price is Right or whatever was going on. And so boredom necessitated activity. You found things to do. And I know you'll, a lot of folks be like, oh, back in my day, we played outside when I was a kid. And I did. My brother and I played outside a lot. You know, we'd, we'd play catch or we'd, we'd shoot hoops in the driveway, ride our bikes, cruise around, do whatever. But really that time and a little bit of technology is what really allowed me to develop musically as a musician. So I was able to spend time learning, learning chords and harmony on my little Yamaha keyboard or I had an early version of Finale I could spend time on the computer practicing learning learning Finale how to notate music and so I developed hobbies around music in addition to just playing I played trumpet I played French horn I played drums I was doing all of that but it was the ancillary things around music that really propelled my career uh, to where it was to where to where we were going and so kind of that you know boredom boredom and space necessitated activity and allowed for sort of free time development so right now take a little uh, musical tour of the the areas here or the um the places that really impacted my sort of my musical upbringing and so we'll start at my house and then maybe we'll make our way to uh We'll be able to see my elementary school and high school are actually right next to each other. Um, and uh, we can see my junior high school, which was very important because junior high is when I made uh, some pretty significant musical strides decisions. And uh, we'll see the high school. We'll see. Um, my family church, the church I grew up in, and I played a lot there. That was very formative to my musical upbringing, my musical experience. But this is kind of a neat, 
neat little retrospective we're doing. So uh, stay tuned, we'll have a good time. Welcome everybody. So uh, we're up here in the high desert, we're in Hesperia, California, and we thought it'd be fun to sort of take a look back at the areas in the town that sort of had an impact on my musical upbringing. So this here, this is my childhood home. This is where I grew up, uh, right here in this house. Actually, if you look over at that window, the corner, that's my bedroom window. Of course, it's no longer uh, a bedroom. I mean, it's still a bedroom, but there's no bed in there. Uh, the computer's still in there. It was also the computer room. Remember that in the 90s? You had a dedicated room for the computer. It was very, it was this very uh, religious place. You had to go do the computer. But, uh, so that was my bedroom, and that was important. There's two windows in there. And it doesn't seem like that really matters all that much, but the two windows being in that corner of the house and having the computer in there was really impactful for kind of my, um, we'll call it my musical boredom. And so what I was talking about earlier and things I always like to discuss is when you look around at where I grew up, you see there's really not a lot here in terms of entertaining children, right? Sure, we have the mini golf course, we have the bowling alley, but I didn't have a car when I'm 12. How am I gonna get over there? That's a hour and a half bicycle ride. I'm not going to go do that, let alone I don't have money to go bowling. And so there were a lot of days where we just, we didn't have anything to do. How was I going to entertain myself? And music became that form of entertainment. So a lot of times I would sit in my room and just kind of look out the windows and take, you know, see what's going on. Um, that side of the house way over yonder, there's houses there now. You see the palm trees and the nice foliage going on, but there was nothing there. That was an open field. So I could just look out the window and gaze out really kind of into nothingness. And that boredom, you know, really motivated me to learn more about music. And so two things that really were impactful. Number one, being in the corner, my brother's room was right here. So he would be jamming on his drum set in this front room. And then I could be playing my trumpet, you know, sort of playing out um, away from him. And we could make that music separately, but at the same time. But then also I had this Yamaha keyboard and that's really where I learned chords because there's a little window on it. And if you played a chord or you played a note, it would tell you what that chord would be. It would show you. So that's how I learned C major was C, E, G or D major, D, F sharp, A. And sure, I could have maybe gone online or I could have found a music theory textbook, but I had this very tactile experience where I could play the chord, look at the chord. So this is fun. If you look, look up at the road, uh, this street. So you can imagine me being a kid ripping down that hill on a bicycle uh, would be a pretty grand old time. Actually, it might be fun. Maybe I'll grab a bicycle out of the garage, Brett, and you can film me <laughs> coming down the hill. Um, but that, that tactile keyboard, being able to play the harmony and, and work with the harmony live um, and sort of experience it, that really internalized the keyboards in my mind. And so we'll go look at my childhood church here in a minute. But when you go and you look at that church, that's where I played a lot of keyboards for church, trumpet and keyboard. And so that's where I really developed kind of that harmonic sense of song structure, how songs are put together, how to play them. But then also in that room, I said my room was the computer room. Um, that meant my room was a very public place, so very sociable. So everyone in the family was always coming in and out of, of my room. Um, to kind of get at whatever was going on on the computer, but I had Finale, I had that music notation software. And even though I didn't know that I would be arranging as a career or composing as part of my career, I certainly developed those skills on the software and that, that curiosity from just spending probably hours um, trying to write a brass quintet or trying to arrange the Danny Elfman 1989 Batman theme music, where nowadays I could probably crank it out in a, you know, a half hour or so I just spent days and days and hours and hours just tinkering and it's that musical tinkering from that boredom with not really anything other anything else to do to entertain me formally it was really integral to my musical upbringing so childhood home mom and dad aren't here otherwise we'd interview them um they're out cruising around but uh yeah this is home and we'll go see the schools the church we'll just see all these spots that had this major impact on my musical upbringing fight on All right, so we're here outside of Lime Street Elementary. Now this was my second elementary school. When I was in the middle of second grade, we moved across town, uh, we, one side of the town to the other, and I switched elementary schools, but it was here at Lime Street that I began my music education. 
And so I was in the fourth grade. My brother really wanted to play trumpet. So my brother had played trumpet and he was really interested in playing music with my dad at church. And the other piece of that is my dad played trumpet in the church. My brother would play along with him. So in third grade, when my brother was in third grade, he's like, I want to do music. And so when I was in fourth grade at that time, I said, well, I want to do something too. Well, my brother had a trumpet. We didn't have another trumpet for me to use. And so I had an option. I could either play clarinet, which my cousin had, or I could wait a few weeks, months potentially, while we had our violin repaired. And so looking at the two, I was impatient, obviously. And so I said, no thank you to the violin, and I picked up the clarinet. And so brought the clarinet here, started taking band, uh, band class here. And it was really here that sort of that curiosity and excitement about music uh, started to kick in. Um, one benefit of it was you got to leave class. So in the middle of the day, they'd come and take you out of class to go take you to your music lessons. Um, but it really, it was that coupled with learning about the instruments. And then my brother uh, struggled a little bit with learning the trumpet fingerings. He could, he could make a sound, he was great, but the fingerings, um, a lot of times I would help him, but that was exciting for me. I liked writing in the fingerings and doing that. And so uh, I would do that for him with myself. I made a lot of my lifelong friends that carried from here through junior high, through high school. Uh, we played in band together here um, in this, in this, at this school. So this is Lime Street Elementary. Um, this is where it all began. So we're going to keep touring around. We're going to visit the junior high. We'll visit the high school and we will visit uh, the church where I played a lot of music. All right, let's keep going. So we're here. Uh, behind me is Ranchero Middle School. And this fairly innocuous stretch of street and asphalt and sidewalk seems, you know, not important by any stretch of the imagination. But when you pan over and you look at this stretch of parking lot right here, this was the very first parking lot where I took my very first steps as a member of a marching band. You see, Ranchero Middle School had a marching band program. And although we didn't do field shows, we didn't do winter guard, winter drumline, anything of that nature, we would don the uniforms uh, once or twice a year to then participate across town at the high school to do the high school sit-in. But more importantly, we marched in the Hesperia Days Parade. Um, if you know me, I love parades. I love going to parades. I love being in parades. It's just, it's one of my favorite things to do in the world is just be a part of a parade. And so here was the first spot where I took my very first steps in a uniform that was much too large for me, but this is where it was. Now, at Ranchero Middle School, I came in from elementary school playing clarinet. Uh, and it's funny, you know, uh, we've interviewed Barney, we've interviewed Rob, all these clarinet players. Brett played clarinet for a stretch as well. But I played clarinet in elementary school. I was the worst clarinet player ever. It was just absolutely dreadful, couldn't play clarinet. And so when I got here, I was not good enough to make the advance band. <gasps> Shocking. Um, but because of my schedule, and I was in, I think, ASB and some other honors courses, the only band that was available to me was this last period of the day, um, sort of like a catch-all beginning band, so to speak. So I was too good for that band in terms of being a beginning band player. I knew music too well, but I wasn't um, good enough to make the other ensembles. So here I was in this band and sort of talking about this sort of musical, this musical boredom and just how do I keep myself engaged and entertained? Well, at the same time, my brother, who was in elementary school, switches from trumpet to percussion. He wanted to learn drums. He got tired of playing trumpet. So me in this class, I said, well, maybe, maybe I'll try my hand at trumpet. And so I started playing the trumpet just on a whim on a Friday. It was a test day. I think I played Good King Wenceslas, but I knew the fingerings because I used to write them in for my brother. So I just pick up the trumpet. I also dabbled in French horn in that class a little bit, but um, that sort of went away. Uh, I didn't get back into horn until high school. But really it was here that I made that switch from clarinet over to brass. And I found that I really had an acuity for the brass instruments. And that really, that really hung, that really connected for me. And so having that ability, really that freedom, because if I had made the intermediate band, the advanced band, I probably would have stuck clarinet out all the way through. And would I be where I am playing clarinet? Pro some ways yes, but maybe some ways no. Um, but sort of living that flexibility, knowing that not on a whim, but I had the option to pursue other musical ideas uh, was really, really started here as part of my junior high education. And that was my band teacher, that was Miss Ingram. 
Uh, Miss Ingram's son Dave and I were in the same grade. Dave teaches elementary music still here in the high desert. But really this road is where I took those first marching steps and I'm still doing marching band to this day. So it's just very, very important to me. I was drum major here for a year. Uh, I got to spin a uh, military baton, but I was drum major on a technicality because uh, I came in second place in drum major auditions, but then um, the kid who made, who won, who beat me, um, he transferred schools. And so he left, so I became a uh, drum major um, de facto, I guess you could say. But that sort of um, kick-started sort of leadership within the band and being a part of the band. But this is, this is a great place, a lot of wonderful memories here. Um, a very peculiar thing, uh, for eighth grade graduation, they had us form a giant line and we all shook each other's hands. It took like an hour and we all went person by person shaking hands of people we never talked to or would never ever see again. Uh, but it was very fun, very exciting, very emotional. Uh, but this is it. This is really what put that stamp of marching band in my DNA. So let's keep on our, uh, our Vogel musical tour. Let's keep going. All right, so we're here in my, uh, my childhood church, the home church here. It's actually two buildings now. Uh, the original building is across the way. If you peek out the window, you can see the side of it. But that's, that's the original church building out there. This building we're in now was constructed, I think, around the time I was in junior high or high school. It's, I don't quite remember the year, but fairly, you know, maybe 20, 25 year old building uh, around that time. But if you look over here, this is, the church was established in 1966, Faith Lutheran Church. These are all the charter members. Now, I was not alive in 1966. Shocking, I know. But if you look right here, uh, we found it. We lost it. Where did? Oh, right there. Mr. and Mrs. Kenneth Vogel. Philane, that's my grandmother. Lynn, Craig, my aunt and uncle. And then my father, Wayne. That's my dad. So um, he was just a wee tyke when this church was built. But uh, as a family, we've been involved in this church um, for years and years and years. Uh, my dad actually played trumpet for the church um, for a long time, and that kind of is what got us into uh, doing music um, as kids. My brother here, follow me, we'll, we'll kind of look in the sanctuary. My brother uh, actually got into it first. He wanted to play trumpet with my dad, and so he would stand with my dad in the old sanctuary playing, um, playing a toy trumpet while my dad played real trumpet. And he got into that, then he started um, taking music at school in the third grade. So in the fourth grade, this grade I was in, I started playing music as well, and I picked up the clarinet. Well, then as we got into junior high, I switched over to trumpet. My brother then switched to percussion. But along that um, path through that trajectory, we built this, this new sanctuary. And with it came sort of like the contemporary uh, church music idea. What were we going to do to sort of hip and enliven the, the music that we had going on? And so what we did is my brother played drums, he played drum set, and this is when I learned uh, keyboards. And so I started playing uh, keyboards in these church services. Now, my involvement in church music is informative from a performance aspect, but also in terms of music theory and understanding music academically. Because when I told my dad, hey, I wanna start playing trumpet in church, he said, okay, and he sat me down at the kitchen table and gave me the hymnal and said, if you want to play, you need to learn how to transpose. You have to understand how to transpose from the hymnal into the trumpet book. And he wouldn't let me leave the table until I understood what that B-flat transposition was. Now I just, I just live in that world. It's, it's second nature. But really that, to me, is where it imp imparted in my mind that music wasn't just something you did, but there was also academic integrity to it as well. You needed to learn about it, not just do it. And so simultaneously, um, I learned the trumpet, started playing trumpet in church, but then I started learning, um, you know, not very elaborate keyboard technique, but I started learning enough keyboard technique and learning my chords where I could vamp and play changes. And so that really, I spent days and days and days, years of my life sitting at that electric piano. At the time, the organist, uh, Marilyn, her organ was right here where the drum set was, and the drum set was actually up against the back wall. And for a long time, it was an electric drum kit. But this cave, gosh, if I had a dollar for every moment I was in kind of this alcove, I'd have a whole bunch of dollars. I'd have at least $3 billion. Um, but that was it. It was really, it was my brother sitting there, Marilyn on the organ, me on the keyboard, and the three of us, um, we really provided 
that contemporary music. And then another family joined the church and they had sons who were the same age as my brother and I, and they were bass players, guitar players. So then we, we were able to um, sort of put together a whole, a whole band as it were uh, here in this alcove. And then the stage, the stage, the pulpit, the altar, the pulpit's over there, the altar, um, all of these rails were moved. So then we realized we could, um, like we do for the Christmas program, we could put on full-blown sort of like worship rock concerts in, her, in here as well. And so we would, we'd pull the rails off, we'd run a snake back to the board, and we had this whole setup where we'd put on these concerts, and the pastor would um, reach out to different youth communities, and we'd have this place filled, usually with kids, like 10, 10 year old kids, maybe were the youngest up through high school, and they would come to watch and um, attend the service. So that's when um, it was very important for me to be able to experience music in those different ways. A lot of times for those concerts, I'd play guitar, uh, keyboards here for the church services. Sometimes I'd play trumpet. A lot of funerals, my dad and I would play when the saints go marching in. It was kind of, people loved it. It was a request they always made. But this, this place, of all the places in my musical upbringing, this is probably the most important because my mom worked here. She was the church secretary for almost, for probably more than 20 years. Um, but she was the secretary here, and so we would decorate the church for Christmas, or we would help her fold bulletins if she, there was a lot to do. But um, I would practice here. I recorded my audition tapes in the sanctuary for college. So this, this place really had a major impact on my, on my musical upbringing and discovering that a support system goes beyond what you have at home. My mom was super supportive, my dad, my brother, was in music with me, but I'd be able to come here and make music and have people listen to it and appreciate it and at times provide that criticism and allow me to make mistakes. Great example was the, um, the groundbreaking ceremony for this building. I was playing trumpet with the organist and we're outside about to play, but um, I asked her what key, she asked me, what key are you playing in? And I told her the key for my trumpet part. And I said, maybe I said G but G in trumpet, it means F in concert. And so she started playing in G, but I was trying to also play in F. So I had to just stand there and not play for the whole groundbreaking because I wasn't thinking things through. I wasn't um, really paying attention to how the questions were being asked. So able to make big mistakes here, um, but also able to grow and develop musically. So this is, this is the church. I'm sorry the chairs are blue. I didn't pick the color. Uh, I think at the time we were going for either blue or green. So we were, we were gonna catch it catch it either way, but just a great, a great place to grow up as a kid to um, develop in my musicianship, and I'm just happy to share it with you. So let's keep going on this great uh, musical adventure. Fight on. All right, to uh, sort of wrap up our adventure in Hesperia, California, behind me is beautiful Sultana High School, there it is. Uh, this is where I went to high school. Uh, at the time, the school was less than a decade old when I started attending here, so it was very new, very exciting, very fresh, very fun. Uh, but this is really where um, a lot of my maybe formal classical music uh, training really got set in stone and kind of my path was uh, decided. That's where I decided what I was gonna do. So while I was here, I. As I mentioned before, I picked up trumpet in junior high. I got here. Uh, I was the trumpet section leader by my sophomore year. So the end of my freshman year of high, you know, high school band, the band director was like, all right, you're in charge. Take the reins and run this trumpet section. And so I was section leader, first chair, all of that very quickly. Um, I was drum major my senior year. And it was during that time as drum major that I decided to try my hand at French horn. I tried that for two reasons. One, I thought I'd get more scholarship money by being a French horn player. And two, I was just, again, bored musically. I wanted something to do. And as drum major, I just waved my hands a lot. I didn't have a lot to do. And so I picked up horn. I auditioned on horn at the various universities I was auditioning for. Also in my time here, that's where my love of percussion really kicked on because I realized that I could do the winter drum line, the spring line, um, even though I was a brass player, I just, that thought never occurred to me. And so while I was here, that's where I marched bass drum, I marched uh, tenor drums, and I really started to develop those rudimental percussion chops alongside my brother, 
uh, and it was great because we just chop at it at home and have a grand old time. But really more importantly, at the school is I took theater classes. And the theater department is probably more responsible for me and what I am today than anything else I sort of did while I was here. And so I was taking theater classes. My drama teacher, that was Mr. Grable, Darren Grable. And he, um, he was great because he was very supportive of the stuff I did in marching band, but he, it was just a great classroom environment, great teacher. Let us really operate our own time, our own schedules. And so while I was with him um, in what we were doing here, the theater classes, I did my first play my sophomore year or my freshman year. My sophomore year, I didn't really do the play because I did spring drum line. My junior year, I did the play. And then my senior year, I had to choose, was I gonna do the play or was I gonna do spring line? Well, I knew I was gonna get a spot on quads, on tenor drums, so I did the drum line. Well, having done the drum line, then auditioning on music, I was still applying to colleges, some of which I was applying to be a theater major. I really wanted to be an actor. I wanted to go out there and see my name in lights and be this big Hollywood star. Um, that didn't really happen, although I do direct Hollywood's band, but I was talking to him about it. He's like, how's the college application process going? I said, oh, it's great. You know, I'm applying here for this, here for that, and here for theater. He goes, why are you audition Why are you applying for theater? I go, well, I just, I want to do this. He's like, you should do music. Every time you have a choice, this or music, you pick music, this or music, you pick music. It's like, why would you do anything else? This is what you're good at. This is what your passion is. And that sort of, you know, curt, abrupt honesty gave me the kick in the butt I needed to realize that, yes, I, I do love theater. I love that segment of the arts community, but I always did choose music. And so if it weren't for him sort of spearheading me into it, I don't think I would have pursued music um, as, as I did. My music teacher here, Chris Fernandez, she was great. Uh, she was willing to let me frack it out on French horn to be the worst French horn player for a year to figure that out. But she herself was a French horn player. And so she had great advice for me on the horn and she was a wonderful resource. But the two of them really, the, my music teacher, my drama teacher set me on this path to pursue music education. And so I really owe a lot to them and what they did. So this has been kind of a little abrupt behind the scenes look at my musical, uh, the places of musical impact here in the high desert. And I hope you enjoyed seeing a little bit behind the scenes, behind the curtain of my musical upbringing and the places that really had an impact on that. So take care, fight on.